All right, Chemistry 3101, this is kind of where we left off last class. We were just discussing intermolecular forces, and we were talking about how intermolecular forces are the forces that hold molecules together um, when they're in a group, right? So if you have, let's say, a liquid, what are the forces that hold the molecules of that liquid together, right? Let's say you had a cup of water. Why is it that if you leave a glass of water out overnight, um, some of the molecules will evaporate, right? Some of the water will evaporate. and You will see a decrease in the level of the water overnight. However, if you were to leave the same volume of gasoline, let's say, uh, you know, out overnight in a glass, I don't know why you'd put gasoline in a glass, but let's say you did that experiment, right? Most of the gasoline would evaporate, right? Evaporine has, uh, gasoline has a much higher vapor pressure, meaning that it uh, boils more readily. And why is that? Why do different types of molecules have different boiling points and different melting points. Again, it's related to the intermolecular forces, the forces that hold the molecules together in a sample. And last class, we covered we covered dipole-dipole interactions, and we also covered um, hydrogen bonding. And today, I want to discuss with you the concept of London forces, which we sometimes call fleeting dipole forces. These are the weakest of all the intermolecular forces that we look at in chapter one. So again, we discussed dipole-dipole forces, which are a result of molecules that have a permanent dipole in them already. And I showed you an example here with some acetone molecules lining up. And then we talked about um, hydrogen bonding and how a hydrogen bond is nothing more than a dipole-dipole force. It's just a particularly strong type of dipole-dipole force. And that in order to have a dipole-dipole um, hydrogen bond, you have to have a hydrogen bound to either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So that is one of the requirements, and we'll talk more about those as the course progresses. And so today, what I wanted to discuss with you was London dispersion forces. So let's say we have nonpolar molecules, right? If you think about um, some of these small molecules that we've seen already that only contain carbon and hydrogen. Well, we talked about what makes uh, a bond polar and what renders a bond nonpolar. And we said that when the difference in electronegativity between two elements is less than 0.5, it's considered a nonpolar bond. That means that any compound that is made out of only carbon and hydrogen, we call these hydrocarbons, and we'll talk more about these later, but any compound that contains only carbon and hydrogen would be a nonpolar molecule. Why? Because it has no polar bonds in it. So let's see what it says here on the slide. It says, if two molecules are nonpolar, meaning they have uh, zero as their dipole moment, remember that the D stands for Debye, which is just a unit that we use to quantify polarity, um, they're still going to have an attractive force between them. Why is that? It's because of these transient dipole moments or these fleeting dipole moments or these induced dipole moments that we call London dispersion forces. Now, if we think about a nonpolar molecule, let me just draw one here as an example. Let's take this molecule. We've got two carbons and we've got, you know, six hydrogens like this. Nothing wrong with that Lewis structure. This is called an ethane molecule. Now, if you think about this molecule as being, you know, an entire, you know, entity, okay? Well, what, what's inside this molecule, right? We have um, protons in the nuclei, but we have electrons that are in orbitals, right? And the electrons are going to be spread out evenly most of the time throughout that molecule, right? So they completely balance all the positive charges in the nuclei. But the thing is this, is that electrons are kind of like hyperactive children, okay? If they can move, they will. Remember that. If electrons can move, they will do it, okay? Electrons like to move. So electrons are in constant random motion within what we call a molecular orbital. And when we treat the molecule as just one entire entity like this, when we think about it as being a big cloud of, you know, um, uh, electrons floating around this entire molecule, we call that a molecular orbital. So again, we have the molecular orbital or we have all of those electrons spread out evenly throughout the molecule. But remember, I told you that they were in constant random motion, right? Now, what if, what if? at just one moment in time, a brief moment. I never said it was gonna be long. What if just by the, you know, by the laws of probability, just at one particular moment in time, all of the electrons kind of go to one side of, the, of one of these nonpolar molecules, okay? And these are nonpolar molecules that are shown here. There's two examples, or two molecules of pentane, which is um, 
anyhow, it doesn't matter. It's just a, a compound that contains only carbon and hydrogen. But the idea is this. What if all the electrons bunch on one side of the molecule just for an instant in time, right? And that's what I have in the green circle here, or the green, uh, the green, uh, I don't know what you would call that, the green bean shape that I have here. <laughs> Inside the green circle, right, I have all these partial negative charges, right? And you can see from the electrostatic potential map that all of the electrons or most of the electron density is bunched up towards the right side of this molecule. Well, what effect is that going to have on this molecule over here? I'll tell you what it's going to do. We know that opposites attract, don't they? Right? And like charges repel. So what that's going to do is since all of the negative charge is on one side of the molecule just for an instant, it's going to repel all the electrons in the other molecule, and it's going to push them all over here. What's that going to do? That's going to render this side, the left side, partially positive, and then there's going to be an electrostatic interaction between these partial negatives and partial positives. Now, there, you, like, you might be looking at this and saying, well, hey, I see a whole bunch of positives and negatives that are attracted to each other. That looks like it's pretty strong to me. But remember, this happens only for an instant in time. Okay, You add up enough instants, and yes, there's going to be an overall attractive force between the molecules, but it's going to be very weak. So basically what happens, again, and I'm just going to phrase it another way, I'm just going to repeat myself a little bit differently, is that the uneven distribution of electrons in the first molecule here renders or causes a temporary dipole in the second molecule, okay? Just by repulsion, it repels all those electrons and then we're left with all the partial positives over here. And then we have a force of attraction. And again, it happens very quickly. And so that's why it's, we call it a fleeting attractive force and that's why it's so weak, okay? So London forces are generally weak. Now. London forces are not only found in nonpolar molecules. Listen to me very carefully. Every molecule is going to experience London forces, right? Even water, which is a highly polar molecule, is very strong hydrogen bonding. You think about water, it's a really tiny molecule. It has a molar mass of 18 grams per mole, but it has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. If you could stack that up to other small molecules, it's got an insanely high boiling point, okay? Now, the reason that we, um, or the reason that water has such a high boiling point is because it can hydrogen bond, but it still has dipole dipole forces and it also has London forces. It's just that when we're talking about molecules that are nonpolar, we're only going to talk about London forces because it's all they have. Okay. But like any weak attraction, London forces, if you add up enough of them, they can add up to be significant. Well, they can be more significant for some molecules than others. In fact, London dispersion forces are responsible for a gecko being able to climb up a wall, you know, completely vertically, and they can probably go upside down too. I don't know, I'm not an expert in geckos, but you can read about that in our textbook. I'm not gonna quiz you about the London dispersion forces in a gecko's feet, but it's kind of interesting if you take the time to look at that. Well, continuing on with this concept of London dispersion forces, I have here three nonpolar molecules on this slide, right? Butane, pentane, and hexane. Right? All of these are nonpolar molecules. They only contain carbon and hydrogen. A carbon-carbon bond is a nonpolar bond, and a carbon-hydrogen bond is a nonpolar bond. So just by definition, all of these are nonpolar molecules. But if you look at their boiling points, butane boils at 0 degrees Celsius, pentane at 36, and then you go to hexane, boils at almost 70 degrees Celsius. Why do they have different boiling points if they're all just nonpolar molecules? It's based off of their molar masses and also related to their surface areas, right? If we have two molecules of butane, okay, if you can imagine another molecule of butane interacting with that molecule, it's gonna have less of a surface area than two molecules of pentane interacting with one another, right? We're gonna have more London forces in a bigger molecule. The same thing applies with hexane. It's an even bigger molecule. You're gonna have even more London forces. So the trend is if we have linear hydrocarbons like these three on this slide, as the hydrocarbon gets bigger and bigger and bigger, as the molar mass increases, as the chain length increases, the boiling points, the melting points are going to increase. Why? Because the London, for, London dispersion forces get stronger with uh, more surface area. If you look at isomers, so if you look at these uh, three compounds here, all of these have the same molecular formula, C5H12, all three of these compounds. So we have pentane, 2-methylbutane and 2,2-dimethylpropane. 
If you look at their boiling points, even though they all have the same molecular formula, you can see that the boiling point decreases as we go from the pentane to the 2-methylbutane to the 2,2-dimethylpropane. The reason why is because as we go across the slide from left to right, the branching in the molecules increases. Right here, we have only one branch sticking off. Here, we have no branches. And then here, we've got you know a bunch of branches sticking off of this molecule here. Well, what happens is that the more branches you have, the less surface area there is. And the less surface area there is, the less surface area there is to interact with two molecules, right? And so the London dispersion forces are gonna be weaker. So what's a trend that you need to be aware of with respect to London dispersion forces? Two of them. If you have a linear molecule, a linear hydrocarbon like these, um, as the chain length increases, the molar mass increases, the surface area increases, and so the interactions are gonna be stronger. And with our London forces, so the boiling points are going to increase. And if we have isomers, the more branching that we have, the weaker the London forces will be. Let's take a look at a problem that um, wherein we have to justify um, uh, boiling points uh, between some compounds here. So it says 1.33 for each of the following pairs of compounds, identify the higher boiling compound and justify your choice. So let's start with A. We got a couple of compounds here. These are called ethers. And again, later on today, we'll take a look at functional groups. But could anybody tell me if I call the first one, like if I call this one A and I call this one B, could anybody uh, surmise as to which one of these would have a higher boiling point? And it's not a trick question. Yeah, thanks, Bruna. It's going to be the second one. Absolutely, right? Why? It's going to be B because it has less branching, right? Less branching. You can imagine a second molecule of B interacting with this molecule, and there's going to be more surface area, right, to come in contact, right? The molar masses of these two compounds are identical, but it's based off of the surface area. B has more surface area or less branching. So we'll put here more surface area and less branching. They are both perfectly good reasons. Okay, let's go and take a look at B. Okay, so I have a molecule. The first one is called cyclopentane. The next one's called cyclohexane. So if I call this one, oops, if I call this one A and I call this one B, you can see that they're both totally nonpolar molecules. Can anybody guess which one of these or make an educated guess, I should say, as to which one? Yeah, it's going to be B, right? B is going to have a higher boiling point, right? They're both just cyclic molecules. They have the same types of atoms, but this one has a higher higher molecular higher molecular weight okay so greater surface area greater surface area i think higher molecular weight would be a better justification here uh let's try oh the next one's a good one c if we look at the next one if i call the first one i'll call the first molecule a and i'll call the second molecule b can anybody tell me which one here would have a higher boiling point yeah definitely going to be b Big time, right? B for big time. And why Why would that be? Yeah, thanks, Bruna. It's because of hydrogen bonding, absolutely. Right? Here we have um, the capability of hydrogen bonding, right? Because we have a bond between hydrogen and oxygen. Here we have an oxygen and we also have hydrogens, but there's no opportunity for hydrogen bonding there because the oxygen is not bound to a hydrogen. And then the last one, the last one, oops, that's not what I meant to do. Here we go. You take a look at both of these. They both have the opportunity for hydrogen bonding, right? But this one is going to have a higher boiling point because it's got less branching. Less branching. Or you could put here greater surface area. Either way is uh, perfectly reasonable. There we go. So that covers London forces. London forces is something I like to talk about. You know, you can sit around and talk about London forces all day. Uh, anyhow, kind of interesting stuff there. And if you, you know, if you're struggling with the concept of intermolecular forces, what would you do? I would take some time and sit down with the textbook and be sure to read it because the textbook always goes into, you know, more detail about the nuances that we don't have, you know, necessarily all the time to go over every little bit of nuances that are covered in the textbook. All right. So section 1.13 deals with solubility. Um, in general chemistry, you probably learned the rule that like dissolves like, right? You learned that polar compounds generally mix with other polar compounds. Let's say you take a polar compound like 
uh, ethanol, ethyl alcohol, which uh, is a polar compound, and you try to dissolve that in water, well, you know that you can dissolve um, alcohol in water. And so that's an example of a polar compound mixing with a polar compound, right? Because water is capable of hydrogen bonding, ethanol is capable of hydrogen bonding, and so they should mix. Also, if you had acetone, right? We talked about acetone uh, at the end, toward the end of the last class that was this molecule, right? That has a permanent dipole in it, right? It had a permanent dipole. So this is a polar molecule. Acetone is also soluble in water. Why? Because it's got a strong dipole and the hydrogen bond is just a type of dipole. Um, nonpolar compounds are generally going to mix well with other nonpolar compounds, right? If you take... Um, an example that they use in the textbook is they say if you have tetrachloroethylene, which is a completely nonpolar compound, like let's say I'll draw it out here for you here. It's this molecule. This is the this is the solvent that's actually used in dry cleaning, right? Because this is a nonpolar molecule, right? There are dipoles in the molecule, but they all cancel out. Because this is a nonpolar molecule, it's good at removing grease, which is nonpolar from clothing that you know you can't expose to water. So there you go. That's kind of interesting. Also, another example of a nonpolar compound dissolving a nonpolar compound is when I was a child, you know, in Canada, sometimes we you go outside and get tree sap on our hands, you know, playing out in the forest or something. And to get tree sap off, it's very nonpolar. So you can't get it off with just washing with water or soap and water. It's pretty ineffective. And so my mother would get out Varsol or some kind of you know, you could even take a rag with gasoline on it and wipe it on your hand and it would come off really quickly. And that's the same kind of concept that's used behind cleaners like Gooby Gun and stuff like that. Anyhow, we know that it's difficult to get a polar compound like water to mix with a nonpolar compound like oil. That's why when there's an oil spill, right, the oil sits on the surface of the water, whether it's, you know, in the, the Gulf of Mexico. I think there was an oil spill there. A number of years ago, or you know, that you've probably heard of the Exxon Valdez that happened a long time ago. Uh, another example would be if you've ever just gone to a gas pump and it's rainy outside today. If you if you uh, ever spill a drop of gasoline in a puddle, you'll see that it pools on top, right? Um, another example would be if you just had you know, let's say bacon grease or hamburger grease or something in a frying pan, and then you put water in it, you're going to see that they're you know the grease is not going to solubilize in water. So we can't just use water to wash oil off of dirty clothing or to get grease off of our hands. In order to remove nonpolar oils, grease, and dirt, we have to use soap. And soaps are nothing more than a fatty acid, uh, basically a fatty acid salt, which is what's shown here, right? If you studied biology, you know what a fatty acid is. It's where you have a carboxyl group and then you have a, non, a big, long, nonpolar um, tail. So what is the soap made of? If you've never studied, you know, um, the hydrolysis of a triglyceride in biology before, um, you know, what's this molecule made of? We've got a polar group towards this end. We call that a hydrophilic group, which literally means water loving, right? We have a dipole here, we have a dipole here. So the resultant dipole is going in this direction. So we do have a big polar portion or a good sized polar portion on our soap molecule. However, most of it is this nonpolar group over here. So if that is, you know, what soap is made out of, how does soap work to remove oil and dirt and grease from our hands? Let's say if you go wash your hands in the sink. Well, what happens is um, all of these little green things here, like if you just look at, let's pick this one here, right? This here, and you have all this spinach here. Well, this part here is the carboxyl group. Okay, so this is the carboxyl group. And then this is that big chain. I'll just kind of make a squiggle like that. So you have, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of those that bunch together spontaneously. Why? Because when they're in an aqueous environment, right, with the water that you're washing your hands with, the polar portion is going to be on the outside because it's what? Hydrophilic, hydrophilic or water loving, right? And all those nonpolar tails are going to be pointed towards the inside because they are hydrophobic, hydrophobic. And what happens is all those hydrophobic tails will bunch together around oil and dirt and grease, and then it'll wash away in the water. And so that's how soap works, in case you've ever wondered. All right, and where do we get soap? Well, you know, this type of soap that is, uh, you know, comes from the hydrolysis of a triglyceride will come from the hydrolysis of a fat. 
So if you go on YouTube, you can find Avogadro's number of videos of people making soap at home from tallow, which is uh, which is beef fat or suet, which is hog fat. And then they just, you know, they, you can even make soap the way the pioneers did, which is, you know, they take rainwater and they filter it, filter it through ashes to get lye, which is a mixture of potassium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide. And then they boil that with fat and then they're able to make soap like that. Something that you might want to try at home or maybe not. Anyhow, kind of interesting stuff there. All right. So that covers all of the content for chapter one.